My name is Charlie, and on this channel, I explore the basic principles of cooking so that we can all become better home cooks. So let's make some dinner rolls. So for these sourdough dinner rolls, we're going to start by preparing our levain, which in this case will consist of 55 grams each of mature starter, flour, and water. I'm using my usual mix of half whole wheat and half all-purpose flour here, but you can really use anything you like. Now the way I prepare this here, it's going to take about 5-7 to seven hours at room temperature to double in size, at which point it'll be ready to use. The nice thing about this recipe is that if you get it started in the morning, you can have it done by dinner time, so I'll also leave a recommended time schedule in the full post on my website, which will be linked below. So here we are about 5 hours later in this case, and my levain has about doubled in size. If you want your levain to rise faster, feel free to increase the ratio of starter to flour to water, or increase the temperature of your environment, and you can of course do the opposite if you want your levain to rise slower. It'll still work perfectly fine as long as it's at least doubled in size by the time you use it. So in a medium bowl, start with 130 grams or 4 fluid ounces of milk, preferably warmed up to room temperature. Then add your entire levain, which should be about 150 grams. If you do the math, you'll notice that the actual weight of the levain added up to 165 grams, but since a lot of it will get stuck to the sides and bottom of the jar, only about 150 grams will actually end up in the bowl. Anyways, just go ahead and stir that all together until the levain becomes evenly distributed. Then we'll add the rest of the ingredients, starting with one beaten egg, one and a half tablespoons of melted unsalted butter, which you've allowed to cool to room temperature, 30 grams of granulated sugar, and 7 grams of salt. Then again, stir until all ingredients are fully incorporated, and add 50 grams of whole wheat flour along with 350 grams of bread flour. Now you could instead just use 400 grams of bread flour if you prefer, but I like to include the whole wheat flour for the extra flavor that it provides. So thoroughly mix in the flour until the liquid is completely absorbed, and you'll notice at this point that the dough is still quite dry, so next we're going to add just a bit of water. You'll want to add anywhere from about 60 to 90 grams, which is about 2 to 3 fluid ounces, so in this case I'm adding 75 grams. The amount you need to add can depend on a lot of factors, mostly the type of flour that you're using, so just use your judgment and only add as much water as you need until your dough looks about like mine does here. You'll also want to work the dough just a bit, either with your hands or with a dough whisk to start to develop some gluten. Then either cover your bowl or transfer the dough to a separate container with a lid. A nice little tip here is to add about a tablespoon of water to your container before you put the dough in there, which will help to prevent the dough from sticking to the container too much. Then transfer your container to a warm environment, either in your oven with the light on, or in a proofing box if you have one, set to around 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 28 degrees Celsius. You could also just keep it at room temperature if that's your only option, but it might just take a bit longer to rise in that case. Now after about 30 minutes, remove the dough from your warm environment and perform one set of stretch and folds to help to develop the gluten structure of the dough. So for this, just grab a small portion of the dough and stretch it up as far as it'll go without tearing, then fold it back over top of itself. Then repeat that process about 5-7 to seven more times until you've gone around the entire perimeter of the dough. At that point, flip the dough over and place the lid back onto your container, then return it to your warm environment for another 60 minutes. After that time, we're going to perform another set of folds. This time though, we'll be performing coil folds in order to preserve the airiness that's developed in the dough. So for these, gently lift up the dough and let it stretch and fold underneath itself as you place it back down. Then repeat that process 3 more times until you've gone around the entire perimeter of the dough. Then return the container to your warm environment and let the dough rise for another 60 minutes. At that point, the dough shouldn't be overly soft and bubbly, but it should be nice and airy with a few small bubbles at the surface. Once that's the case, it's time to start dividing and shaping our rolls. So start by generously flouring your surface, then turn out the dough with the top side facing down. Now I like to bake these rolls in a 10 inch cast iron skillet, so I typically divide my dough up into 14 pieces because they fit nicely into the skillet that way, but you can really divide it into as many pieces as you like depending on how big you want your rolls to be. And to make the rolls as evenly sized as possible, I actually like to weigh them out using my scale, but that's definitely optional as well. So once you've got your individual pieces, shape each one into a ball by folding the outsides into the center like so, then flipping them over and rolling them around with your hand to form them into top balls of dough. Now I also like to keep a small bowl of water on my surface so that if my dough is having trouble picking up traction, I can just splash a bit of water on my surface to help out. Then as you shape the rolls, place them into your 10 inch cast iron skillet or other similarly sized pan, which I like to dust with rice flour to prevent the rolls from sticking. And I also like to roll each roll in a small amount of rice flour before adding them to the pan to prevent them from sticking together too much. 
At that point, it's time to let the rolls proof one more time, so just cover them up with a dish towel and place them back into your warm environment for about another one and a half to two hours until the rolls spring back slowly when poked with your finger. You'll notice at the beginning of proofing that they spring back right away when poked, but by the end of proofing, the gluten structure will have broken down slightly and they'll look more like this. So before we finally bake these rolls, we're just going to brush them with a little bit of egg wash to help them brown, which just consists of one egg combined with one teaspoon of water. And I also like to sprinkle the tops of each roll with a bit of flaky salt to add some extra texture and flavor. Then go ahead and throw the rolls into your oven, which you've preheated to 400 degrees Fahrenheit or about 205 degrees Celsius for 18 to 25 minutes until they've reached your desired level of browning. Once they're out of the oven, I also like to drizzle some melted butter over top, and at that point, just let them cool in the pan for at least 5 to 10 minutes before transferring them to a wire rack to cool the rest of the way. So, now that you know how to make sourdough dinner rolls, if you want to learn how to make an easy cranberry sauce to go with your holiday dishes, be sure to click that video in the bottom right corner of the screen. So, there you go. I'll see you all in the next one.